you know, the majority of companies, 60% of the 70% of the companies I've worked with, product managers aren't empowered to make hard decisions and trade-offs and stick with them so that we can build and ship the best stuff. And if you're at that company, you should know that many of the other companies have the same issue, but it's going to be hard to have great job satisfaction if you don't have the political support and the organizational support to make hard decisions and stick with them. Today, my guest is Rich Mironov. Rich has been doing enterprise B2B product management since 1988, worked at six Silicon Valley startups, and has been doing an interim CPO for more than 200 tech companies. He wrote The Art of Product Management and was the founder of Product Camp. Rich has taught at top business schools worldwide, at conferences, and shared the first product manager, product owner tracks at the annual Agile conference. Hello, Rich, and welcome to the podcast. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much for letting me join remotely. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I am very excited for our conversation today. And I would like to start by something that I discovered when I was exploring your curriculum. So I thought that I thought that you graduated from Yale University in physics with a thesis on dinosaur extinction. Correct? That that's right. A very long time ago, although not as long ago as the dinosaurs roamed <laughs> the earth. So uh, yeah, I did a very lightweight uh, degree in physics. It was actually a lot closer to a computer science degree. But I didn't know it at the time, and in those days, we had very few people understanding what uh, a computer science undergraduate degree would be. So it turned out to be physics, and they didn't care what I wrote my thesis about because I wasn't going on to become a physicist. So uh, it was all about the asteroid theory of the dinosaur extinction, which was new then. Oh, okay, okay. How did you move from uh, dinosaur extinction theories to business and product management? Uh, Hewlett Packard, which was one of the premier wonderful companies in those days, actually recruited me from campus. So they sent a truck to New Haven, Connecticut, put my five or six little belongings on and moved me out to Silicon Valley. And I was a software developer for several years. Mm -hmm. And then I dropped out to do an MBA and really came back as a product manager. Oh, okay. So you you started as development and then product management. So yeah, it was the yeah. it's the the path that many of us have taken to product management. Exactly right. And it means I I, I haven't written code for money in decades and decades, but I do speak pretty fluent developer, which is important because if you're going to be in product management in tech, you have to have the, enough respect from your development team that they don't uh, lock you in the closet and disinvite you from the stand-ups and make fun of you when you're in the room. So you have an extensive career as a product management and as a software developer as well, (laughs) we had just discovered. Uh, Mm -hmm. But in product management, you started in 1987 in Tandem Computers. Uh, And from there, from this date until today, you are still doing product. So could you please share with us some memorable success story uh, about the product that you managed that had a significant impact on the market or that uh, it's just a good lesson that you learn on throughout these years? Sure. Uh, one of the companies I worked for, which was pretty famous and big in its moment, was called Sybase. It was one of the early database war competitors against Oracle and Ingress and Informix and DB2 before Microsoft actually licensed the Sybase product and renamed it Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, and, and I had picked up the, the whole product set for the company uh, except for the database. So I had the networking connections and the ports and six or seven pieces of technology. What was interesting about that was um, uh, the big selling point for Sybase was that you could put the server on any platform they supported and the client on any other platform they supported, and they would work together. And so the engineering team that I jumped into as the very first product manager had these seven little pieces of network connectors and and client and server side things on 42 different operating systems. Mm -hmm. And I was the only person on the planet who could name 42 operating systems. And it also turned out that a, a fair number of them were getting little or no use. But we were running a QA cycle every night 
even in the early 90s. And it took all night to run because we were running, you know, 42 times 41 combinations of all this thing on slow machines. Mm -hmm. And so one of the very first things I did after I joined that group at Sybase was I started end of life in old platforms that no one was using. And every month for 18 months, I put a bullet in the head of one of the platforms that almost no one was using or was obsolete. And at the end of that, we were actually able to run our nightly build in six hours instead of 12 hours because we had eliminated all these combinations that didn't matter and didn't have customers. And before that, there wasn't someone who was both thinking about the tech, but also thinking about the financial implications of mm. having obscure software on platforms that almost nobody used that couldn't be supported, that we had engineers and hardware devoted to. So by chopping those out one at a time, it freed up all of this great engineering energy to build the next new thing. Well, wow. can you uh, say again, uh, you reduced the time from 12 to 6? Oh, so, so we were running a test cycle every night, uh -huh. and it had to test every combination of every platform, client side and server side. And when you have 42 different choices on each side, it runs all night because you have to have the OS2 client against the VMS server and the Mac OS client against the AIX server and et cetera, et cetera. And it didn't finish in the morning. Sometimes our engineers couldn't start work first thing because the build hadn't finished from the night before. And mm -hmm. so by eliminating rows and columns in that matrix, we freed up not just people who were working on the wrong platforms and hardware and equipment and costs, but we sped up the development cycle Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, the other thing that uh, that I built while I was at Sybase that was entertaining for the time, um, so this was early, early in the days of Netscape and the, and the web. So this would have been like 95. And uh, I put together a group which was called the Internet Products Group at Sybase. We didn't know what that meant. And the very first thing we built was something called web.sql. Mm -hmm. And it lets you drop a, um, a SQL statement onto your web page and it would run and deliver the results, which doesn't sound crazy today. But... The very first folks, for instance, who sold wine online in Silicon Valley in 1995 had to have a way to have you put your customer or order number in and retrieve your order. And before 1995, there was no way to do that. So I had a little team at Sybase, and we were the very first people to make it possible to visit a web page and have it return unique results out of the database. So that's 30 years ago. That's crazy. <laughs> Now it seems like no big thing. You know, every 15-year-old with, with access to the web can do this. You know, it's on Google Docs. But uh, 30 years ago, that was new. Wow. <laughs> okay, things have changed a lot, for sure. And you have seen a lot of things. Um, and, uh, and I would like to also touch uh, in the, the challenges that you have faced throughout your career. Sure. Uh, so... Could you please share like any particular stage of your career that was uh, difficult and you need to reinvent yourself? Uh, sure. Um, let's, let's think about 2001 for a moment. And you had a prompt for me before on this. So uh, I did six startups in my day, four of which the only things I got out of them were good life lessons and character building because they didn't work out so well. And and I was at my third startup early in 2001, and it wasn't going well, and we weren't going to succeed, and I was failing, and the, the company was building something that the market really didn't want. So checking our calendars here, I quit, I resigned on September 1st of 2001, which didn't seem like a particularly important date on September 1st. But 10 days later, uh, at least, you know, 9-11 comes along and the oh planes my. are hitting the, uh, the the towers. And I was out of a job because I had resigned. And I had a daughter who was going to go to some famous university someday, which was going to be expensive. And a mortgage in Silicon Valley, which was expensive and no income. And so I discovered on September 12th that I was a consultant. Because the definition of a consultant is someone who doesn't have an income, needs to make money, and is going out and looking for opportunities. Oh. Uh, it, it, it was um, life-changing for me, not as much as the people in New York who, you know, who were, were killed or injured, but it, it rearranged my world entirely. Mm -hmm. And I, I had never in my career had to call someone up 
and ask for help or work. It had all come to me kind of naturally. And so I put together a list of 20 or 30 people who I'd worked with before. And I started emailing and calling them up. And I had no idea how this was going to go. And I discovered something that I think everyone should know. And I simply didn't, which is people will help you if you ask them. Hmm. And so here were 25 or 30 people, almost every one of which responded right away, bought me breakfast, looked for opportunities, um, helped me in ways I had never had to ask for before. I, I didn't understand humility until I had to ask for help. Um, and and the, the two things almost every single one of those people said is, is deep in my memory. One was, tell me how I can help. And the other is, I know we've worked together, but remind me again what product management is. <laughs> so here were people I'd worked with for a decade or more. I'd done my product management work. I thought I, you know, it was obvious. And almost none of them could tell me what a product manager was or did or why you would need one. Right? I think it's still true today. Almost everywhere we go, uh, folks outside the development cycle don't understand or really care what product managers do. And so uh, I started a blog at the end of 2001 because I needed to get my thoughts in order and start to share out to the world the kinds of problems that product managers solve. Mm -hmm. um, and I called it Product Bytes. By the way, I've been writing that monthly column since December of 2001. So you can figure that's 22 or 23 years of a monthly column. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's really done well by me. But I didn't understand until then that the world knows less about product than I do. And I have to keep explaining and teaching what problems we solve before we can generate work that product managers do. Yeah. Yes. And you, touching on this last point, you referred that on your last uh, blog post, um, that you referred that it's important that product folks continuously share what are we doing and, uh, yeah, and why and why and why it matters right why so so i observe that at least in the enterprise space the sales and marketing and finance people don't really care about how we build software mm -hmm. they just want to know when it arrives and how much money we can charge for it and what to say about it and so as a product person when i'm dealing with my go to market side internal partners and stakeholders i shouldn't be talking about sprints and story points and backlogs and development engines and tech debt. I need to be talking about revenue and customer benefits and financials and why the things we're building are so important that we shouldn't cancel them for your next good idea. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, every new thing seems new and every customer wants a new thing. And so the sales and marketing team comes in and wants to throw away the roadmap, because there's a new idea. Exactly. So you are always after the next shiny thing around the corner. That's right. The shiny thing. And and we've worked really hard to put together a plan that addresses the two or three or four most important things for the company. But uh, a phrase I use all the time, roadmap amnesia. Okay. When a salesperson talks with a customer and the customer asks for something, that salesperson's brain is wiped clean. There is no memory of anything that's on the roadmap or the plan or the commitment. And so they come back with a fresh request, assuming that we in engineering and product are just waiting around for a good idea mm -hmm. instead of what we have to respond with, which is here are the three company objectives that we're supporting and how they're going to lead to money and growth and happy customers and shareholders that get paid. Exactly. Right? Um, but I, touching again on this point of how to talk with uh, C levels and salespeople, mm -hmm. I also imagine that maybe it helps to share those product management language, like uh, what's a sprint and what's tech depth, because sometimes you need to uh, justify why you can't build the next big thing. You are going to uh, solve the tech depth that will allow you to uh, run three times faster. Right. And so, so I spent decades trying to get CEOs and VPs of sales to care about any of that. And I failed, right? Um, they're, they're really not interested. Mm -hmm. So, so we have to come back to not sounding like we're making excuses. I can't give you what you want because sprints or backlogs sounds like 
I don't like you and I don't care, right? It's what, what I have to come back and say is we would love to do that thing that you've suggested, but let me remind you what the top three things are on the plan that we've committed revenue to, that we've announced to the world, that customers are waiting for, that the board of directors approved. So if your thing is bigger and more important than the three things we built our plan around, and, and I quote the money, I say, this is a, we expect we're going to get 15 to $30 million out of this upgrade. Mm-hmm. So I can cancel the upgrade, but only if you're going to tell me that the thing we're going to put in instead is worth more than $15 million, right? Not, we have a backlog, nobody cares. Not, we're on one-week sprints, nobody cares. Not story points, not an engineer's out sick, not my dog ate the compiler right? Mm-hmm. No one cares why engineering can't build what they want. What they hear is we're either unwilling or we're lazy, or there's some reason we simply refuse. When we come back with the alternatives, the or, right? We say, that's a w- wonderful idea, but there is no space on the roadmap. There's no white space. There's no engineering team sitting around waiting for work. There's no idle, you know, we're not eating bonbons and playing Fortnite all day. We're working (laughs) on the company strategy, right? So rather than saying, I can't because of technical reasons, I want to say, I can't because we have higher business priorities that our technical work supports, and here's how much they're worth. Exactly. And when when I use those magic words that have currency symbols in them, Right? We're talking about 2 to 10 million euros if we can ship this product on time. Right, So if you have something that's worth more than 6 to 10 million euros, we can delay that. But you have to promise the company and the shareholders that there's at least as much money in your thing, which we don't know how big it is. Right, mm-hmm. But notice I didn't start with it's technically hard. I didn't start with the engineers are busy. I didn't start with, we need a special data scientist, right? No, this is a business discussion about priorities and investments. And so if we start there, everyone I think around the table understands the conversation. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, it just, because on our side, we are saying that the technical depth, the engineers are busy, is a consequence of what we are saying, that the, yes. the backlog is full because we want to achieve these key metrics That's results. Right. That's right. And consequently, the engineers are busy and we don't have uh, space, but that's a consequence. It's not that's a, right. And, and if, for instance, retiring that technical debt is going to let us deliver you know, our reports twice as fast and close five times as many customers, then I want to I want to attach those things. I don't expect my go-to-market side partners to understand or care about technical debt unless I can explain how it affects customers and revenue. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So you need to make that shift to to money That's language. Right. Um I wanted to touch uh, on the topic that we referred before, that when you shift to consulting and you yes. you did that shift in your career, uh, a bit pushed by consequences <laughs> of life. But yes. um, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, what are, were the main differences that you experienced being a product management in the team and uh, inserted it in a company versus um, in a consultant, being a consultant? Yeah, I think there's there's a few really fundamental things. One is, um, it, if I'm coming in as a consultant, it's for a very short time, right? I'm expensive, I'm senior, no one's going to hire me as a consultant for years and years, right? Uh, over over the my consulting career, I've done, I think, 15 interim or temporary chief product officer jobs, right? Where they forgot to have a chief product officer or they let their last two VPs of product go or they quit or nobody knows, right? Um, And in general, those things last between three and five or six months Mm -hmm. because the very first thing I assign myself is to make sure that the company is going to hire my replacement, my full-time replacement as soon as possible because um, I'm not somebody who's going to be there for the long term. I'm there for short-term damage control, short-term replacements, keep things moving. Um, So usually I assign myself with the CEO's agreement 
to be the lead recruiter and interviewer of all of the lead product management, you know, VP or CPO candidates so that I can help pick somebody who's really good for the company and knows what they're doing. And I can then leave, Mm -hmm. right? My, my goal as a consultant is to be there as for as short a time as possible to fix the things that can be repaired in a short amount of time to keep things running, keep, keep th- people from quitting. Um, but I'm generally postponing any really big, long, hard decisions that are going to take a half year or a year. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to leave those for the person who comes in as the full-time VP of product so they don't have to undo everything. Yeah. Right? Um, and then the other thing that, that's really important about consulting is you have to think about the company, not just the product. So usually when I get these calls, the company strategy is not clear or they don't have one, right? The engineering teams are misorganized or not organized. Um, marketing doesn't agree with sales about who we should sell to, right? The company is usually broken in many ways. And as the most senior product person at the company, I have to help identify the issues, not just on the product management side, but on the company side. Uh, I'll give you one example and then give it back to you. Um, It's often true that uh, when a company builds, they have a really successful product and they build a second product. And the sales team doesn't sell any of the new product and they complain it's not any good, right? When we open it up, what we find out is that the folks on the sales side can all make their commissions by selling the product they already understand, that the world wants, that is understood, that they've been selling for years. And so no one bothers to even sell or try to sell the new product because they don't need to. Mm-hmm. Notice that that's actually a compensation problem on the sales side. So if we recognize this, we can go back to the head of sales and the CEO and say, we need to make a tiny change in the sales compensation model. No one is allowed to get to 100% quota unless they sell at least one unit of the new product. Now, Mm -hmm. suddenly, everyone in sales is selling it, right? Um, Notice if you're on the product and engineering side, there's nothing you can do about this brilliant, wonderful new product that you built that no one's selling unless you identify where in the company the problem is. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, you you touch on this topic as well on your post uh, all the time. All yeah, the time, f- finding um, the synchronicity. Uh, missing the word. Um, yeah, where are right. um, clashing? Right. We, we have to synchronize. We have to align exactly. the different departments, and we can't do that if we're only thinking about the development process to get software into the release queue, mm-hmm. right? This is at the leader level, at the VP level, at the CPO level. It's about the company working well, not just the engineers working well. And so we we look around and we see where are the breakages? Where are we failing to close people or get them in the funnel or get the right products or sell in the right geography or have the right approvals from government? Whatever it is, product becomes the larger frame for how do, we, how do we sell more? How do we make customers happier by being focused? Who is it for? Where's the benefit? What's the value, right? Shipping bits is a piece of the problem or the, mm-hmm. or the job. But if you're just shipping bits and waiting for someone else to figure out how it turns into money and company strategy and success, then you're doing only 40% of the product manager job. Mm-hmm. And you, you touch up on a point that is many times you are asked to come when there is no VP of product or it never existed one or it just disappeared. Yes. And that touched, touches on a, a, a blog post that you did or a, a repost that you did on LinkedIn and many people uh, cherished and uh, uh, liked and generated many comments that was about the fact that product management roles uh Many people are leaving the companies on that are on those roles that are usually really w- high paid roles. Uh, do you do you have any thoughts on that? Why that is happening? Yeah, and I don't think that's new. I mean, it was it was a recent survey that I don't know sixty percent of all the product managers out there 
are either looking to leave their company or would take a call from a competitor or another company about an opening, right? Um, uh, but you know, let let's let's get to the basics. Product management's really hard. It's unbounded in the sense that you're never done. There's always one more problem. There's always one more customer. There's always one more department or stakeholder who's unhappy, right? Uh, engineering is always late, almost always, right? Um, the design folks we work with that we love tend to be pretty fussy, right? Um, this is a really hard job and it has no authority. It only has responsibility. So if you're at a company where either there's no product leadership or the product leadership doesn't understand how product folks work and how we add value, then you're in a situation that's very hard to succeed in, right? Um, whenever something goes wrong, we know that the product manager was at fault. When it goes right, you may not know this, but uh, at least in the enterprise space, every single big deal that every enterprise company closes this quarter, uh, when you ask them why, it's because we had great salespeople. Mm -hmm. Right, every company they're all above average, but when it doesn't work, or there's a bug, or there's a problem, or there's an outage, or it's late, or you know, um, we 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 had some people leave, or where the pricing's wrong, uh, it lands on product management, and so we end up feeling embattled. We feel put upon. We we feel pressured all the time. It's hard to do a great job, um, and there's too many. There's so many edges to it. There's so many opportunities that many of the product managers I've worked with over the years can't sleep at night. We're so busy thinking about the next thing we can do tomorrow to make our product better. It's hard to relax. It's hard to take the weekend off. So I think it's a really hard job. Within that, there are companies that really have a product first view where product managers get to make decisions and lead on strategy and meet with customers and deliver great, great products. And when we're at that company, we feel five meters tall and way smarter and younger and better looking, right? But I would say, you know, the majority of companies, 60% of the 70% of the companies I've worked with, product managers aren't empowered to make hard decisions and trade-offs and stick with them so that we can build and ship the best stuff. And if you're at that company, you should know that many of the other companies have the same issue. But it's going to be hard to have great job satisfaction if you don't have the political support and the organizational support to make hard decisions and stick with them. And have you experienced uh, companies that were on that side of the spectrum to come to to make the transformation to empower product managers? And uh... Yes, uh, they don't call me because they don't need me. <laughs> because they're doing it right. Um, and I see much more of that on the B2C side. I'll tell you why in a sec. So if you're, if you're Apple or Spotify or you know, Amazon on the retail side, whatever, and you have 100 million users, there's no one user that pays you so much money that when they call your CEO, they can change your roadmap, right? At $10 or 9 euros a month times 100 million people, no one of them is so important. And so the B2C folks can really run their business on the numbers, right? On the statistics, on the experiments, on the, right? If you're in an enterprise space where uh, you're going to bring in 5 million this quarter and six deals represent most of that because they're a half a million to a million a piece. Um, the pressure on the company to sign that deal, no matter what the customer wants, is very intense. Usually the board of directors is calling the CEO, oh, once a day maybe, right? Mm -hmm. To ask if we've closed that deal with J.P. Morgan Chase or British Telecom, whoever it is, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so when a late arriving requirement pops up in the sales cycle, right? Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase would sign right now today if we could just add teleportation to our product, right? The CEO says yes, and the sales rep says yes, right? And then they come to us afterwards and say, well, we have this contract, and we're bringing in, you know, 100 million yen, and all it requires is this tiny little bit of software, probably no more than five lines of code, just add teleportation to what we're doing, right? <laughs> so in the enterprise space, it's much more likely that the product managers get overruled or outmaneuvered politically because individual deals are big and lumpy 
And if you lose that deal, folks get fired. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Good insights. <laughs> That's right. and, and, and I'll tell you, I must not be very smart because I've spent my career on the enterprise side of product management, not the consumer side. And have you seen enterprise side doing it right? Yes, I have. And um, okay. uh, most of that really, I think, requires a whole executive team that understands how software product companies make money. Mm -hmm. right? So if we can sell exactly the same bits, no changes, no specials, no modifications, no compile switches, no separate install, we get essentially 100% of the revenue to keep less our sales commissions. And if the entire executive team understands that that's the way to make money in the software business, to sell the exact same bits, the current release, the product we have, then everyone's much more aligned around building what we need to build next. Mm -hmm. In an organization where sales and maybe the CEO consistently overrule product and engineering with a one-off, with a special, with a professional service with an integration we hadn't had before with a separate hosting instance, whatever it is, we very quickly become a professional services company because all of the, all the engineering and product is taken away from the core product and moved toward the specials that each of our six biggest customers want. Yeah. But now with the um, move of um, B2Bs to product-led companies that they try to do their own onboarding and they try to tackle a part of the market that is like the, the, not the big fish, but like the okay. ones that can do the onboarding by themselves and you have a bigger market share, sure. maybe that... Yes, I, I think that's right. Helps to reduce. <laughs> yeah. So if you look at a company like Zero, right, the accounting folks out of Australia and New Zealand, um, I think their average charge is, I don't know, $50 a month or $100 a month. And they have millions of customers. So they look much more like a small business or B2C play. Um, if you're selling uh, real-time operating systems to automobile companies to put into their braking systems, There's only five or six automobile companies in the world that matter. Mm -hmm. And they each understand that they have tremendous leverage. They have uh, the opportunity to hold your contract up until you give them everything they want. Right? And so some of it's the market and some of it's how our executives behave. But if you're selling things that are, I don't know, $50,000 and up, this is the pressure you're under. Yes. Interesting. Well, it's part of the job. Part of the job. And and I think rather than decide that that's evil or bad, we on the product side have to understand it and then come up with strategies and tools and approaches to address it directly instead of just complaining. Yeah. Let's jump to um, product vision and strategy. Um, okay. Again, we already touched it, but uh, you... You quote uh, one of, of your um, topics that you referred uh, was that the revenue goals are not the company's strategy and illustrate that is a common problem in companies. Um, so can you please elaborate a bit more why this poses a problem? Although Sure. <laughs> and, and, and it's funny because um, most of the coaching I do, so I coach, I don't know, I have six or seven at any one time, six or seven VPs of product or chief product officers that I'm doing one-on-one -on -one coaching for. That's most of my work. And when the same topic comes up over and over again, that, gosh, that generates a blog post for me, right? And so in December, uh, you know, a month ago, uh, four of my coaches came back and said that the CEO has announced the goals for next year. And the goal for next year is to grow revenue 40%. Now, Unfortunately, that's of no use. That, that doesn't help us either from a product strategy or a company strategy point of view. You know, are we going to, we, we have to make some hard choices about how we're going to grow and who the customer base is and what we're going to do that's different, right? So for instance, and this was a, a client of mine down in New Zealand, um, you know, we were talking and one of the possible strategies was to open up their product to some new geographic markets to move into the UK and to move into Canada, 
Mm -hmm. right? And a different product strategy was to focus on churn and lost customers and figure out how we can retain more of our customers. And another different strategy was to build a, a, a completely new product and go into a new market. And another different business strategy was to find some adjoining spaces where we could cross over, mm -hmm. right? Now, any one of those might lead to the revenue and the growth we need, but the one you choose is going to cause the company to do completely different things, right? So if we're going to launch in the UK and Canada, okay, in Canada, we're going to need French and English support. What are the date formats? Are the laws different, right? Where do they need to be hosted? What about data security, right? Long list of things which you would do if your strategy was to uh, move into Canada and the UK from Australia and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Right. If that's not your strategy, we're not going to do those things. We're going to do something else. Right. If we think this is really a, a funnel and churn problem, we're going to spend the next year interviewing every single lost customer for why they left and see what we can do to engineer or improve the retention and the product in the places we're losing. Them. Right. Um, now, either of those might be a good business strategy. But telling me that we want to make more money doesn't help me figure out what product and engineering work is going to be required to hit the goal. Um, uh, you know, we, we could decide that we're in the um, also in the food service business and start up a, a business where we make lunches for school children. Right? Is that a good business? I don't know. Do we know anything about it? No, we don't. Could it make money? I have no idea. Right. Mm -hmm. But someone somewhere had an idea that maybe children in schools need lunches. Right. But we're in the enterprise CRM business and we know nothing about it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so for me, and, and, and finish the thought um, when the company has no business strategy, then product often has to step up and drive the business strategy or find someone else to drive the business strategy or help someone drive the business strategy because otherwise we can't build a product strategy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and to say that the other people in the room aren't doing their job and so I'm going to invent a product strategy that makes no sense, I think is a fail. Yes. And in, in your opinion, that uh, a product strategy slash business strategy should come from the C-levels and the product managers together? Uh, I think it's it's a it's an iterative process, right? So the company leadership comes up with a few strategy possibilities, and I think each of the functional groups has to lean in. So product, do we know that people want it? Can we price it? Will it make money? Engineering, can we build it? Sales, do we have do we have the people who can sell it? Do we know where it goes? Marketing, do we have a way to generate lots and lots of leads or interest? Uh, support. Do we know how to help people fix this when it breaks, right? Mm -hmm. So the business strategy is the container, but product and engineering are often the ones pushing the hardest about which of the products, which of the company strategies make sense and we can execute. Yeah. So I don't believe that it's driven only from one side or only from the other side, right? This is, this is a long discussion. It happens all year long. If we're only working on strategies in December and January, they're probably worthless. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, yeah, it's interesting that uh, product management needs to come closer to C-level language and speak their language, but the other thing needs to uh, happen also on the other side. Other, uh, otherwise, there will be strategies that are about uh, making X more money or growing right. X percent. Right. And so, so one of the other reasons it's hard to be a product manager and some people aren't going to make it, you have to not only understand the technology and the customers, you have to understand the company's business strategy. Otherwise, you can't make decisions at the product level that make any sense if you can't match them, understand them, pin them to the larger company strategy so they make sense. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a product manager and you're just working with your engineering team and you have your head down and you don't understand how we make money, then, you know, I have to hope you have a manager who, who's doing the rest of the job. Yeah. And uh, so in your opinion, what can uh, product managers do when they are facing with this 
situation of having no product strategy is fine. Yeah, I, I think the first word that comes to mind is humble, right? Um, product managers don't own company strategy. But if there's not a company strategy, I often lead with three or four alternate strategies, all of which may be wrong, right? But if we can hold up two or three or four examples of what company strategies look like and get everyone talking about which of those is closer to our choice, right? I don't care who decides. I don't care who takes credit for it. But someone has to kick this process off and get it going. So I might come in, just as I described, and, and lay out three different um, independent strategies of which we can't choose more than one. Mm-hmm. right? And force a discussion not about making money, but about how we're going to make money, who it's for, and what we're going to build to create that money. And get the conversation going in a much more um, concrete, substantial way. Mm-hmm. Right? So. The rest of the company may not know what a strategy looks like. And so if I can present two or three or four different strategies, by example, we can now argue about which of those or which other strategy we might adopt. Right? Are we going overseas to the UK and Canada? Are we focusing locally on churn? Are we building a new product? What are we, what are, what's the number one way we're going to make money next year? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> That's right. And and if someone else in the room has a better idea, I love it, right? Yeah. I want the other executives to lean in and say, no, no, that's not our strategy. Our strategy is to go up market or down market or go to consumers or, you know, um, in-app uh, fees and pricing, whatever it is, right? But you have to have a strategy that's specific enough that you can tell which activities are on strategy and which activities are not on strategy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And also that helps to, um, when uh, new shiny things come along, you can use that to push That's right. That's a great new shiny thing. I love that new shiny thing. Um, If you think that's worth more than the strategy we put on the board last week that we sized at 5 to 20 million euros... Notice I keep coming back to the money, Mm -hmm. right? So tell me a story why your really good idea that you had while you were commuting into the office this morning is worth 10 million euros. Yeah. And will you bet your job on it? (laughs) You are are now making a circle, going back again to the beginning of our conversation. Right, right. Because telling someone that their idea is bad or stupid doesn't help. Telling them that we're busy in engineering doesn't help. Well, go hire more people, work faster, whatever, right? We, we, we have to address it as a, a choice between strategies. Mm-hmm. And if the thing you're proposing is off strategy, it doesn't matter. We're not doing it because we have a strategy. Yes. And also that idea, you are touching now in something interesting that is sometimes we have this idea of uh, uh, we are lacking resources to build what we would like to build. But having... Illimited resources can be a curse. Well, I've never met I've never met an engineering team that could do everything everyone wanted them to do. Exactly, but for a moment, if you could, that would make your strategy nonsense and your product uh, absurd. Sure. Uh, uh, of course, it would. Um, but but I, again, I notice on the go to market side, there's this general belief that engineering's not busy that there's room for one more thing, that they're not working so hard, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're overpaid, right? I could do this, It's right? Um, it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. The less I know about your job, the easier I think your job is, right? Engineers believe that selling is easy. Salespeople believe that engineering is easy. Yes. Right? Um, and so, so the we're out of resources is really not the right answer. Okay, we're always out of resources. There will never be enough people. And and I've done a bunch of audits around this where we look at the the backlog or the demand stream. And we're not 10% short of engineers. We're usually 20 times short. Okay. When we add up all the things all the customers and stakeholders want, 
right? It is 30 times the engineering team or 26 times the engineering team. It's impossible, Mm -hmm. right? We're not on the margin here. We're not talking about one more engineer. We're talking about 5X or 10X. And no company can afford that until we bring in some of the money, right? And uh, thinking that this is just a matter of squeezing one more thing in, I think misses the pattern. Mm -hmm. Every single person in your company has a really short list of 25 things they want. (laughs) And if you have 300 people at your company, right, you've got 7,000 things on that list. We are never, ever, ever going to get to the bottom 6,900, right? Anything below the top 20 in your backlog will never be worked on, right? So the idea that we're going to put some algorithm in and evaluate the 190 things in our backlog, complete waste of time. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we are reaching the end of our conversation, okay. Rich. Um, so just final thoughts. Uh, uh-huh. As someone with your experience, uh, what emerging trends or technologies do you see as being significant that will have a significant impact uh, in the future? Uh, or what trends do you see um, as exciting? Yeah, good Good question. I'm seeing the product-led trend, but on the longer time scale, right? So in, on a 20-year cycle here, 25 mm-hmm. years, where more and more companies are becoming product-led, not because it's philosophically good or because we're important, but because it's a way to reach more people with product and therefore generate more interest and revenue, mm-hmm. right? To get out of sales-led and move toward product-led. I think that's coming. Uh, I think the AI trend is dramatically overstated for this year. <laughs> I think we're at the top of the hype, hype cycle. I've written about it. I think in six years and nine years, we're going to discover that some pieces of AI were really important. But I think we'll be surprised at which ones they are. And almost all of the 2024 experiments will fall on their faces and fail because we haven't really thought through why we're doing them, who they're for, how they're going to lead to better product, Everybody is fascinated by the tools, not by the business applications. And so we're all busy putting AI into our roadmaps, but we can't remember why. Mm -hmm. Um, And then maybe one more. um, You know, I I see a lot of cross-functional work here. So in a lot of good organizations, product folks move from product marketing to product management to support to marketing and back. There's a lot of good circulation there's a lot of good job changes where we grow as uh, individuals and employees because we're understanding and learning how other parts of the company work and when we get back to product we're so much smarter and so much more empathetic because we really do know what other folks do in their day jobs yeah. so I'm, I'm i'm loving that that's nice yeah so you you think it's important that a proud, a proud person moves around the uh, Well, either they move around or they spend some time. Uh, When when I bring in a new product manager, I might, for instance, send them over to our tech support group and have them listen on the second headphone for two days. Yes. Right? Yes, yes, Uh, yes. And then maybe go out into the field with the sales team and not say a word, but go out on five sales calls, right? Mm -hmm. And then sit with the marketing folks and try to understand why the campaigns are or the social media are what they are, Right. I don't think you have to take the job, but you have to spend a few days with your mouth shut, listening and learning and understanding and making friends in every department in the company. Yes, that's super important for, especially for, I think for all roles, but for product managers to understand what the others are doing. That's right. When, when we go to the finance team and tell them we need a new part number, at some companies, that's a small thing. And at some companies, that's a really big thing. Yeah. Final question. Uh, which blog posts or books would you recommend for a product manager that uh, should like, are the must, must reads in the to-do oh, there's, list? There's so many. When I started uh, 20, 30 years ago, there was nothing. But there's so many good thinkers and writers. Uh, top of my list, of course, um, Teresa Torres and her book on continuous discovery. Uh, Josh Seiden and, and Jeff Gotthelf. Josh has a book called Outcomes Versus Output that's really good. Uh, A longtime partner of mine, Ron Lichty, uh, who's an engineering CTO, VP of engineering, wrote a book called 
managing the unmanageable. Mm -hmm. Um, And then other people, anything from Jared Spool, anything from Holly Hester Riley. Uh, If we go back in the history files to Steve Blank, who is the great thinker in the 80s and 90s in Silicon Valley, um, those are people that go to the top of my list. Mm -hmm. Okay. And these links that you have here are from you, correct? Yeah, I put a few links in our notes here. <clears throat> what do product leaders do? How do we talk mm-hmm. about money? Um, and I have a really old post that I love called The Four Laws of Software Economics. Mm-hmm. Again, back to the money. How do we understand the way money is made in the software product business versus in the pro- in the software consulting business? Exactly. And for me, those are completely different animals. Yeah. Well, we'll sure to make uh, to add this up on the description notes so people can reach them. Great. Well, thank you so much, Rich. It was an enlightening, uh, very nice conversation. Good, my and pleasure. I I hope you enjoyed the conversation as well, and we'll Thanks, see each and, other. And I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to to getting back to Lisbon and seeing everyone in person. <laughs> me too. Me too. Uh, we'll see each other in October. If yes, uh, we will. maybe maybe soon. <laughs> maybe sooner. Well, thank you. All right. Take care.